Good morning, gentlemen. Mr. O'Brien, let's talk about uh, the upcoming examination on uh, Chapter 2, Breaking Up is Hard to Do, The Origins of the Cold War between 1944 and 1947. We have the Soviet Union flag on the left with the hammer representing industry and the circle representing agriculture. And old glory on the right. Okay, we watched that video. Now remember, <clears throat> we had this thing during World War II called the Grand Alliance. The United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. And even though we're not big fans of communism, we thought that being allied with the communist would be much better and less evil than having to fight the fascist Italians and Germans in the imperialist Japanese by ourselves. But having said that, remember that the Soviet Union that did not really fight against the Japanese until the absolutely very end of World War II as the curtain was coming down. Now, the Soviet Union was not happy <coughs> because for two years, between 1941 and 1944, almost three years, the Russians had to fight the Germans by themselves. We couldn't open up the second front to take pressure off the Russians until June of 1944, D-Day. And what a terrible price the Allies paid to try to get a foothold into Europe, but we got it done. Now, Stalin is a pragmatist. He may be a lot of things, but he realizes something is for sure. Property is security. And because the Soviet Union had been invaded twice in one century by Germany, he wanted to put himself in a position where that could never happen again. And the key to that will be the territories called Poland, and even those territories we call East Germany. So Stalin is not going to leave World War II without having a buffer zone, because he knows that Germany will rise like the phoenix from the ashes yet again. And financially speaking, they did. All right. We have had a president since Abraham Lincoln in 1864, run for re-election during a war, and this is President Roosevelt. You know, he suffered from polio in his 30s, was, combined, was confined pardon me, to a wheelchair, and the, uh, he had a bad habit, a very bad tobacco habit, nicotine. I always saw pictures of him with that cigarette holder and the cigarette, but his diet, the stress of the war, the depression, High blood pressure had led to heart disease and also had led to, uh, uh, shall we say, complications with his uh, vascular system. He was 62 years old. I know he looks a lot older there, running for his fourth term, and quite frankly, he was not a healthy man. When Roosevelt was cleared by the Navy doctors at Bethesda, I still don't get it. I mean, they put him on a diet, they restricted his cigarettes, they gave him bigger blood pressure pills, but the idea that he could run again for a fourth term, I don't know. I think they were throwing the dice, and as it turned out, we were right. Roosevelt did not survive his fourth term or see the end of the war. All right. You know, we talked about the two conferences, Yalta and Potsdam, and the idea was basically, right, what would happen to Poland after the war? Would the Soviet Union keep Poland, a country created after the Versailles Treaty? Or would there be free elections behind Eastern Europe, such in places such as Yugoslavia, Poland, Austria, you, know, you name it, right? So there was a big, very bitter debate what was going to happen to Europe and the rest of the world after the war. And this is basically what these conferences were about. Yalta, Russia, and Potsdam, Germany. But the thing was this, the Soviet Union finally agreed that three months after the Nazis capitulated, that they would attack Japan, finally. They would attack them in the areas of Manchuria, the northern islands of Japan, and basically in Asia. We fought the Pacific War pretty much by ourselves with a little bit of help from England, Fran um, uh, uh, England Australia, New Zealand, and some of the other minor allies. Uh, don't tell them I said minor. They wouldn't appreciate that. Okay. Now, Roosevelt did everything he could to deal with Stalin as a gentleman. He did. He was under the impression that if you was basically honest with Stalin, 
treated him with respect, right, man to man, that he could be trusted. He went so far as calling Stalin Uncle Joe. Did Roosevelt know about the millions of army officers that he had killed during the purges and the Ukrainians who would not join the idea of collective farming? Yes, he did. But he realized that if it was going to be any type of future in Europe, any type of future for the, uh, the United Nations, he's going to have to treat this guy with respect and dignity. Truman won't have the same feelings about Stalin. In fact, Truman will think that he's really a son of a, well, you know what he thought. But if you take a look at the map here, man, this is 1945, the way that it was supposed to be. All right. But when the war is over, the Soviets will control everything from here all the way like this. And this is where the famous Iron Curtain came down uh, that Winston Churchill talked about at Fulton, Missouri, getting his uh, honorary Ph.D. Remember, Harry S. Truman, who came into the war late, vice president of the United States, didn't even know about the atomic bomb, was from Missouri. And the Japanese surrendered on the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. All right. So the idea of moving the Polish border a little bit over to help the Soviets feel that they had a security buffer zone was talked about. But quite frankly, what really what Stalin really wanted, he wanted Germany. He wanted Germany to be taken right off the map. If he could have pushed Poland all the way into West Germany, he would have. Hell, if he could have gotten Poland and Germany, he would have taken that too. You know, at the end of the war, Stalin told FDR, and later uh, Truman, that before we start talking, I want you to guarantee me that we will take 50,000 members of the SS and shoot them. Churchill said, I don't care. Truman said, oh, you've got to be kidding. We don't do human rights violations. Even the SS have a right to a trial. So right off the bat, we can see that these guys are playing for the blue chips and that they're very serious about the post-war positioning of their borders. We talked about Winston Churchill, Sandhurst, uh, Sandhurst Academy, graduate by the skin of his teeth, fought in several wars all over Africa, the Boer War in South Africa against the dervishes, the Islamic fundamentalists in Sudan and Egypt, was a war correspondent during the Spanish-American War for both English and American newspapers was the Secretary of the Navy, actually fought in the trenches across from Adolf Hitler. What a life. You could spend an entire semester talking about Churchill. But Churchill warned FDR not to trust Stalin. As far as he was concerned, Stalin was the prototype to, I guess you could say, Darth Vader. You can watch that video again. That's really good. It's a short one. Okay. And then, as we can see in the map, Stalin lived up to his promise. But remember, Stalin doesn't do anything unless there's a payoff. And when the Soviet Union went into areas of Manchuria, northern China, that's the uh, Iron Belt, he expanded further into the Sakhalin Islands and these islands of northern Japan. Some of them are going to still be under possession of the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union today. In fact, that's where the uh, Russians are going to build some of their submarine bases during the Cold War, their, nu their nukes. All right. Now, there's the flag of East Germany. It's important on the test. Remember that Germany will be divided into sectors, four sectors, France, the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union will have all of East Germany. That's where the Iron Curtain is going to come down. And Berlin is going to be divided. East Berlin will be given to the Russians, the American sector, the British sector, the French sector. But unfortunately, Berlin is going to be surrounded by Soviet territory. Berlin, I believe, is 115 miles on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. And so Berlin, West Berlin, is going to be a tiny little dot of democracy floating in a sea of Soviet control. And quite frankly, men, it's going to be a thorn in the side of every president from Roosevelt all the way up to Reagan. All right. Now, in the sense of fairness, and this will be on the examination, the Allied Reparation Commissions actually gave Stalin and the Soviet people $10 billion. Men, $10 billion back in those days was a chunk of change to help them rebuild. You may not know this, but when the Soviet Union began to withdraw from Germany, 
because they didn't know what their future plans may be. They stole every piece of German equipment and factories they could. They left everything empty. They took the doorknobs with them. They even took the railroads with them. No, I'm, I'm serious. They shouldn't have done it because they weren't leaving when they found out that the Americans were not going to come back and occupy Europe. They basically could do what they want. When the Americans left in a hurry, it created a political vacuum in Europe and the Soviet army was already on station. So they're going to take over. All right. That was our little breakout session we had. Uh, what a day. What a day. Everybody remembers 9-11. I remember I was when President uh, Kennedy died as a young man. But everybody remembers the generation when Roosevelt in Warm Springs, Georgia, he went there because of the, of the volcanic activity, if you will. There were warm springs. There were sulfur springs that helped him with his polio. And they used to emerge him into these warm mineral springs to help him with the pain. He died of a cerebral hemorrhage, actually while he was getting his portrait painted. He told his wife he had a horrible headache. He wanted to go to bed. He did. He had a hemorrhage of the brain, and he never recovered. And now poor Roosevelt is dead, April of 1945. And Hitler's astrologers actually supposedly predicted this. But they also predicted that the Grand Alliance would fall apart, but it didn't. It got close, but it didn't. All right? So, right before Roosevelt dies, he wanted to bring back the dream of uh, Woodrow Wilson, the League of Nations. He said, now this will be called the United Nations. Now, Stalin went along with FDR, but deep down inside, he truly believed that the, the United Nations would never work. Because remember, in the Security Council, Russia's there, part of the Big Five. And he, the Russians can veto anything they want because they're part of the Security Council, which basically means that, you know, Russia's going to be able to uh, block anything good we do because they have a super vote. All right? Uh, talked about Poland. We talked about Yalta, right? That's the Russian Miami Beach where all the Soviet high command used to live, Right? And Stalin, as soon as he's dead, the optimism disappears, and he begins his program of occupying Eastern Europe, okay? Harry S. Truman from Missouri comes in, knew nothing about the atomic bomb, knew nothing about what was going on. In fact, he met the president about three times, and each conversation wasn't even 20 minutes long. He was completely in the dark. Later, they asked Truman about becoming president at the peak of the, the end of the conclusion of World War II. He said, I felt like the moon and the stars and the planets had fallen on top of me. And now, here it is, the, uh, basically the World Series, and our starting pitcher is gone, and we're bringing in a relief pitcher. But he did a pretty good job. Now, guys, remember, Operation Manhattan was to secretly produce the bomb. Congress didn't know. I got to remember now, it was either $2 billion or $12 billion. I have to look that up, man. That's the problem getting older. Sometimes you forget this stuff. It was a massive secret program, and there's the gadget, the actual device that was in Los Alamos, New Mexico, that fateful day in July of 1945, a little village called Alamogordo, which was nothing but desert. And on the right is Dr. Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer Oppie, the 40-year-old physicist who was brilliant. Now, even though uh, uh, Einstein told and warned uh, Roosevelt about the Germans' progress in making the atomic bomb. He actually didn't work on it. <clears throat> but he was the one who suggested to Roosevelt that they do it because the Germans might be able to pull this off. And you know if Hitler had it, he would have used it. Now, gentlemen, when they found out that Germany's atomic program went nowhere, several scientists in Chicago and also several scientists in Los Alamos began to question the morality of using this weapon. But, you know, the United States just kind of disregarded, disregarded that protest, went ahead with the program, and they produced a weapon that was actually, when it was dropped over, not on, but over Hiroshima at about, I think, 1,300 feet, I forgot, actually produced a fireball hotter than the surface of the sun. Even though the uranium bomb was not totally efficient, it was more powerful than they, they thought. It was more powerful in New Mexico. This thing is a monster. And there's Commander Tebbets in the Enola Gay, named after his mother. I got to talk to Commander Tebbets back in the day. 
And to these gentlemen, for the most part, they did their job, and they didn't seem to have a lot of regret. But as years went by, and the stories came out about the 80,000 Japanese who died from radiation sickness and from the energy of the bomb, began to, shall we say, become more like doves and not hawks, because it was a horrible responsibility to have to live with. But they were soldiers, and they did their job. Okay? This is an American soldier months after... It's funny because if you go to Hiroshima, that's the Peace Tower. Uh, that's the place where they, it's still there. It's the living memorial to the Hiroshima. Minna was almost a three-quarters of a mile to a mile of absolute, utter destruction. We talked about the idea that after the atomic bomb went off, there was a lot of uh, rain that showed up. The bomb had actually created that 60,000-foot mushroom cloud. It actually created a weather pattern. And that weather pattern dropped black rain, which was soot, ash, highly radioactive subparticles mixed in with the dirt. And the Japanese were parched. You know, the target was the Hiroshima Bridge, and they missed it by about 50 yards. And when it detonated, the Hiroshima River evaporated by 8 feet. If you really want to read a good book about this, written a long time ago, look up a book called Hiroshima by John Hershey. Wow, it's a fantastic read, and it's a sad read, but it's, it's history. All right? This is Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, Oppie. When they did the test at Los Alamos, Oppie quoted the Hindu Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of God, where he said, Now, I think he's, he was quoting Shiva, Now I have become deaf, the destroyer of worlds. You see, the Hindu Bible, which is older than the Christian Bible, has a trinity too. And Shiva is the great destroyer, right? So, uh, really interesting. Later he became uh, convinced that nuclear weapons were not morally the way America should go. And so the FBI and the Atomic Energy Commission began to think that Oppie was going to the left. And they took away his security rankings. The man who gave the atomic bomb to the United States later became one of its biggest critics, Robert Oppenheimer. All right. And then we also talked about a little bit about the KGB, the Committee for State Security. Remember, they snuck scientists in at Los Alamos, and that's why uh, Stalin was getting real reports about the atomic bomb and wasn't really, really surprised when Truman told him because he already knew about it. Now, we thought it would take the Soviets like 10 years to build an atomic bomb out of uranium, right? Uh, they did in four, 1949. And if you look really close... That's, uh, that's Premier Putin of the Soviet Union. And not only is he a black belt, I think, in jiu-jitsu, karate, and a great chess man, he's, a, he, he's really good at riding horses. But, man, he's KGB. That's serious. So, all right, man, remember the test is uh, next week. It's going to be uh, 20 questions and uh, true and false, multiple choice. And if you study this and look at it and look at your notes, you should be really good. So enjoy the day. This is OB signing off and saying thank you. And, uh, you know, we'll see you.